question, and I don't. Um, in some ways, legal immigration, the way we've designed it, is not optimum. In fact, uh, let, me, let, me, let me take it. I'll, I'm going to give you the full loaf of bread, if you don't mind. So legal immigration today was uh, designed in the 1960s. The principal means by which you come into this country, and if you really want to get nerdy about it, you can read my book, Immigration Wars. It's probably worth 99 cents on Amazon. You know, it's pretty easy to get. Chapter one is the set of proposals, so you don't have to read the whole book. So legal immigration was is designed principally by family preference. So people, if you're a spouse and minor children, you have a spouse and minor children, or you can bring them in. Every country has that, right? Your, your spouse and your, your kids, bringing people together that way is, a, is basically an international value. Every country has that. We're the only country that has beyond that adult siblings and adult parents. And so for 50 years now, we've had what's called chain migration, where it crowds out all other forms of legal immigration. So if, you know, think about it, you could see how a, a grandma would be petitioned and then she would be able to petition her brother, and her brother could petition their daughter-in-law, and it just it goes out like this. It crowds out legal immigration. 85% more or less of all legal immigration comes through family petitioning. Canada has a, a population of one-tenth our size, and it has more economic immigrants than we do. So in Canada, if there's a shortage of welders, or if there's a shortage, I mean, they'll take all entrepreneurs. They'll take anybody that wants to start a business, uh, anybody that has money that wants to invest it in their country. They generally, you know, they're pretty easy. They don't have all the bureaucracy and lose the files, and they actually have an efficient system as well. But in Canada, it's an economic driver. They're, they're bringing people in that can immediately add value. In the United States, we turn people away that could make a direct economic contribution Think of all the PhDs and masters in all of our great universities. The significant percentage, you'd be surprised how many, how many foreign-born people are getting masters in STEM-related fields, and very few of them can stay. So we train them in the best universities in the world, and then we say, see you later, go compete with us back in India and China and Malaysia and Brazil and all around the world. This is the system we have. So I would narrow the number of people coming by family to what every other country has, and I would create, based on need, based on the economy, based on who can make a contribution to create jobs in our own country, create, a, create an economic strategy. It would be like us having the first half a million first round draft picks. We were the, you know, we were the New England Pats, you know, every year we'd get get to pick 500,000 Tom Brady's. It would perpetuate you know, the dynasty that you all should be quite proud of and I'm very jealous of. But <laughs> In fact, today a lady uh, that had a walker said, uh, had a bumper sticker on it that said, Free Brady. <laughs> I took a picture of it just as a long-suffering Dolphins fan. But that's the way to solve this problem is to create a guest worker program to deal with the shortages that uh, where Americans aren't in the fields anymore, and, and to create an economic driver by narrowing the number of legal immigrants that come through family and expanding it based on conditions of the economy to create a catalyst for high sustained economic growth. And here, just one more point about this, because um, I know that Donald Trump wants to restrict all legal immigrants to come in. We're a big country. We're, we're, we're a country capable of absorbing people, and if you want to create 4% growth, the way you do that is to have a growing population that is productive, that creates productivity and economic activity for others. And immer legal immigrants, once established, create two times more businesses than native-born Americans. It's a fact. I'm not making it up. Legal immigrants form more families than native-born Americans. Family formation is an important part of sustained economic growth. If you have an inverted pyramid like this, where young people are having to pay for more and more older people, our entitlement challenges are going to overwhelm us. And so there's a lot of good reasons to make sure that you have legal, efficient immigration. And the one thing that we have to have in order for that to happen 
is securing the border and dealing with illegal immigration because no one believes right now that we're serious about doing that because the federal government is not serious. We need to fix that first before we get to the economic benefits of a legal immigration system. Yes, sir. Governor Bush, uh, would you accept Russia's annexation of the Crimea as a fait accompli, and would you s support us sending Ukrainians weapons so that they could successfully defend their nation? No, and yes. Um, some historical context on this. You know, the United States never accepted uh, the Soviet occupation of the Baltics. We never did. And I think that's the proper policy. There was always some hope the United States was going to be there. And in fact, we were there at the end. It's one of the great moments of foreign policy, great moments in the world, where the wall fell and totalitarian communism was obliterated by our economic system that is far better, that creates more opportunities for people, that gives them the possibility of pursuing happiness, and a foreign policy uh, system or foreign policy uh, philosophy of peace through strength. It worked. And we should have that same philosophy that we would never allow for the annexation of Crimea as part of the Russian Federation, to give them hope. Uh, and the costs for maintaining that occupation should be higher for the Russians. We should not make it easy for them to do this. So, so and the second part of your question, we should be providing the, the Ukraine government, which is the first reform-minded government that they've had in a long while, needs our support. It needs our long-term commitment. It needs us to provide defensive weapons, defensive capabilities. They need to upgrade their training capabilities. Uh, they are threatened each and every day by further incursions. The cost right now for maintaining this um, annexation of Crimea is extraordinarily high for Putin. And so we need to make sure that we support our friend. And this will send a signal, by the way, to Russia as it relates to, to their threats in the native, NATO, born, NATO countries as well. I think it's an important point. We should do this in concert with our European allies. All this stuff, by the way, we don't have to go it alone. We don't have to be the world's policemen. In every one of these cases, when we leave, the net result is that others feel confident that they can follow that they can be involved in this as well. So I, it's a great question, and I think we should be engaged further. Uh, this, is a, this is a government that actually does want to reform its, its process. There's huge debt loads, and if we abandon them, and if the world community, particularly Europe, considers this kind of marginal, after encouraging, by the way, Ukraine to break away from Russia, uh, if the European countries don't provide the kind of support to back up the reforms, then Ukra Ukraine could easily become a failed state. And that, that would be a disaster for the world. What, what's your view on this, out of curiosity? I'm not, I haven't been asked this question. Is yeah, no, I'm curious about your view. Uh, I share your foreign policy view. I am deeply concerned that the public statements from Iran by the military leaders, including the foreign minister in a meeting with the head of Hezbollah, recently said, don't worry, our commitment to the end, the little Satan, Israel, is secure and will be accomplished with the money we're getting, and then the big Satan comes next. And there were recent deaths of America rallies in Iran, and the ballistic missiles. Most people, I think, I think that 9-11 was not a made-for-TV movie. I take this very seriously. I do too. And the Israeli Shabbat, the security service captured a Hamas operative a week ago, and they, and you said they're receiving every all their money and weapons from Iran, and they're digging tunnels like crazy. So I think we're heading for a disaster if, if, if nothing is done. But so I share your views, and I'm very impressed by your concepts on foreign policy. Thank you, sir. You gave me the full loaf of bread because I gave it to somebody else. I, that. <laughs> yes, I apologize. I have not been looking back here. You're next after this. Yeah, it's a beautiful town. Thank you. Um, I, I don't live in Keene. I live south of here, but anyway. Where do you live? Winchester. Yeah. Fantastic. Maybe I'll be there too. <laughs> got a sneaky I feeling I might be. Small. I don't know. You don't know Rich Killian. I had to make a comment that I love that you just asked him what his opinion was, that you were listening, because we've been to another person's event and he doesn't listen. 
So anyway, um, I, can I ask you a question, uh, the personal question? Sure. Would it be all right? Yeah, absolutely. Have Should I fasten my seatbelts or am I no. okay? It's pretty easy. It's pretty straightforward. All right. Have you ever cried in the office? Cried in the office in my job? Oh, yeah. Yeah, no. Um, I've cried. I've cried for joy. I cry. Uh, look, you, you don't know the bushes. We, we're like crybabies. But... <laughs> no, I, I'll tell you, the, the heart, I'm a, I'm a, I guess I'm a, I don't know what I call myself, a practicing Catholic. I'm informed by my I'm a converted Catholic. It gives me a lot of serenity. And um, there's some really difficult decisions that you have to make in public life that don't necessarily, aren't in concert with your faith. Uh, death penalty being one of those. Signing death warrants and then participating in the process, um, not an easy thing to do. I'm not like crying, like sobbing crying when that happens, but it's very, uh, there, are, there are moments in public leadership where um, quietly, you know, you don't want to cry in public all the time, but where, yeah, of course. Um, but a lot of times, crying for joy. I'll, I'll give you a story on that. I, my first week in office, uh, I had to go to a federal court. And it was in Miami, and the guy was threatening to take away the program for the developmentally disabled in Florida. For whatever reason, our state had just totally abandoned the program. It was underfunded. It was just wasn't working. And this guy got very angry. And for some reason, he waited for the new guy to get in. I mean, literally my first week in office, and he, he summoned me, which I thought was a little odd. I didn't know the federal judges could take over state programs. I thought that was inappropriate. Still, to this day, think that that's probably not right. But apparently he had this power, and so I went and said, give me a chance. I mean, come on, man. I'm just first week in the job for crying out loud. Uh, let us go to the legislature so that we can reshape our program for the developing disabled, which we did. We increased funding. We moved to more of a community-based model. We had a 27,000-person waiting list. And this is the story that you hear if you actually go out and listen to people. This, the biggest fear for people that have children that are adults that are severely disabled is, can I outlive them? Wow, I mean, if that hadn't touched your heart, to think about how it is to live a life like that, you're loving your child with your heart and soul, you're doing everything that you can. And I have, I have many, many friends in this position because of uh, moved by this kind of experience and being a candidate to try to understand it. Uh, they're all my, you know, I have many friends because of this, you know, the experience of doing this. We fixed the system. Still a tough time for families to be able to do this. But there was a, there was a, um, a thing called CAFE. So at the end of the session, we had this funding. No one, these, these families never thought it was ever possible. They were just beaten back all the time. So we go to this, in Orlando, to the CAFE conference for all the families with disabilities. There were thousands of people. They still have it every, every year. For my, my eight years, I did the state of the state address in front of these people and then spent three or four hours um, you know, taking pictures and signing things. Back then, not everybody had a selfie, but now you, know, been, you can imagine what it was like. And people would come and just, we'd cry. Cry for joy. That's, you know, life, life shouldn't be about, look, I'm a nerd ball, I'm a policy wonk, I love policy, I hope you get a sense that I'm kind of, at least my views may be informed a bit. But this is about helping people. If you can't have, you know, if you can't show your humanity, it's really not, I mean, you don't want some guy up there that's just like from Mars. <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked. You're the first, that's my, you're my first that asked that question. <laughs> yes, sir, don't blush. I didn't mean it the way you think. Father, <laughs> well, so am I. Does that make you feel better? <laughs> Acquisition and transportation of energy is a very dangerous and often explosive situation. Acquisition? Yes. And transport, like rail or yes. pipeline? Years ago, uh, down in New York, the Long Island Lighting Company spent, at that time... Sounds like you might be from there, by the way. Originally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can tell. Spent over uh, a billion dollars building a nuclear power plant on the eastern end of a 130-mile-long island. The nearest bridge was 70 miles away. Right now, they're talking about building a new pipeline here in New Hampshire. 
What, are you, what is your position and what are your proposals to ensure that safety and evacuation are dealt with even before a pencil touches a pad on the transportation and acquisition of energy? That's what the process ought to be about, is to make sure that you have safety, you have input from communities, you make sure that the right-of-way is done in, the, in a way that is, it minimizes the, the economic impacts. I mean, in this state, your, your, your tourism, like Florida, is a huge deal. I mean, it's really important to make sure that, that you do this, all of this, in a way that doesn't, you know, that's a balanced approach. Here's, here's one of the problems, though. I mean, we have, I'll give you, a, not a New Hampshire example, but a, a Midwest example. We have the XL pipeline. It's gone through massive environmental challenges. In, in Nebraska, there's a, a part of the, uh, the geology there that is quite sensitive, the water supply, it's a sandy area. They've gone through all sorts of studies. They finally got all this stuff approved. Lots of local input. Governors all had to sign off. And all the while, the administration has said, well, we're still studying. I mean, this is like, it's taken three times, two times longer to study permitting the XL pipeline as it, as it took to conceive the idea and build the Pentagon. Six million square feet in a, in a swamp. I mean, this is political. This is not thoughtful. And the net result is that the, the oil that would have been shipped from Canada into our refineries is being railed. And the railing of this of oil is significantly more dangerous in terms of all the things that you bring up in terms of community, uh, all the you know the rails going through communities, the danger that that brings. We've already seen it. We've seen a huge explosion in Montreal for a rail that was uh, not regulated properly. And so I, we have to have a balanced approach to this. But in, in a country like ours that needs to be dynamic, I just would urge people to consider. Could we build the interstate highway system anymore if we were starting from scratch? I'm from Florida. Do you think we could actually build a spaceport to launch a man on the moon that inspired the world? Can we build a bridge in your old part of the world, the Bayonne Bridge, that allows for super tankers to go under it to the largest East, East Coast port? I mean, it takes an act of God to do the things that were taken for granted a generation ago. And while it always is important to to maintain, respect community interests and to respect environmental considerations. Let's don't stifle the country to the point where we don't do anything big anymore. That's where we are. <laughs> yes, sir. You can, you can talk. <laughs> big man. <laughs> I'm on your side. <laughs> You can stand up and give me a picture while we do it. <laughs> now you can ask the question, we'll this is, do a video. Uh, so you did touch upon some early childhood and stuff um, and kind of helping people that are dealing with poverty. And so I appreciate you talking about that. I just had a question of, um, since we know how important it is for early childhood education, uh, New Hampshire alone we have, nearly 50,000 children living in poverty, yep. many of which don't have access to that early childhood education. Uh, if elected president, would you support any type of uh, universal pre-K or any other type of early access? So I'll, I'll quickly tell you the Florida story and then convert to, to the federal government. Florida, we have, a const we have a constitutional amendment that requires all four-year-olds to go to literacy-based early childhood um, education, all four-year-olds. I supported it. I didn't support it because I'm a flaming liberal. I supported it because I think to create a right to rise society, every child should start kindergarten capable of being able to be successful. And then we ought to have a gate at third grade. And this was all part of the strategy. Start early, make sure every teacher is trained on literacy to begin with, that they work as a team, and that at the end of third grade, a kid can read to be able to learn. And we cut in half the functional illiteracy rate partially because of our real commitment. Eighty percent of kids are in four-year-old programs in, in Florida. No state comes close to that. Now, we do it a half day, uh, and it's a, it's a universal entitlement funded by the state. If, if many families want to expand that, that's fine. And we require literacy-based focus. 
We require assessing in the first week, so next week or two, whenever kindergartners show up in New Hampshire, in Florida, they'd all be assessed uh, based on phonemic awareness, that their ability to 